If I have seen this video already, it's been a little while, um, so I'm going in here kind of cold turkey, but I, I, I left it in my playlist, so it's here for a particular reason. Um, normally I'll ramble on a little longer than I, I, I choose to, but since I don't remember exactly what was going on in this one, let's just go ahead and, and, and get after it. To see if it's worth it to get an M2, we have some information that pretty much confirms it. For those of you waiting to see if it's worth it to get an M2, we have some information that pretty much confirms it. Because yes, if you thought the M1 series was powerful, wait till you hear what the new MacBook Pro did to the Mac Pro. Evan Blast just shared everything you need to know about the Pixel 6a since, I mean, Google just doesn't do it for it. And uh, we have even more leaks on future Macs and iPads from a very trusted source. I'm Jaime Rivera. Happy Friday for everyone. And I'm just seriously hoping that we don't hear more BS on the news and can actually enjoy the damn weekend. This is Pocket Down Daily. No, we kind of don't have any real official news today, but since the Pixel 6a is somewhat official, we can consider it as such, even if uh, what we have are really leaks to help Google out with their job. Earlier this week, we got two fully detailed hands-on videos on the device, and now the one and only Evan Blast shared a full set of press renders on Twitter. Yes, there's nothing really new here, but at least we get to see the phone in its full high-resolution glory from every single angle. It almost seems like these are the press images that Mountain View will be using for advertisement. On a more interesting note, though, Evan also uh, shared a full and detailed spec list for the phone, revealing stuff that we hadn't really heard yet. We can expect the 6A to come with a 4306 milliamp hour battery, 6 gigs of LPDDR5 RAM, 128 gigs of UFS 3.1 storage, and support for 4K video at up to 60 frames per second. I'm curious as to how Google plans to meet its 24-hour life with these internals, but since the 6.1-inch display will only run at 60 hertz, maybe that will be the trick. Now it's a so, well, let, me, let, let me let him finish. Interesting is if you notice, I mean, this pretty much is like an iPhone 13, meaning it's almost the flagship. It, it pretty much is if it's got the tensor. Now All right, so one, I'd like to say, kind of related to, to this, but not. Uh, today, I just happened to sell my Pixel 4a. Uh, I really like that phone. I, I, I got it back in 2020. Uh, here we are in, in 2022, and, I, and I've sold it. And I usually don't hold on the phones that long, but it was an affordable device. I bought it for $500, not you know, it retail for $350, you're right. But for $500 on eBay, I got the phone, the case, a, a pair of Pixel Buds and a Google TV with Chromecast. So if you you know average, well the the all re, the retail prices for all of those was well over five hundred dollars. So I was happy for what I paid for what I got. Um, but I'm actually excited about this Pixel Six A. So I said, well, I don't need too many pixels floating around. So let me go ahead and just sell this one, and, and I'm happy that I did. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. And, you know, of course, he compares it to the, uh, you know, the iPhone 13, which at this day, and there's another video I'm, at, I'm going to, to, to record over later or voice over later. But, yeah, that 6.1 inch screen, that's definitely by design. Like the iPhone is 6.1. Well, the, the base model, so not the mini and then not the Pro Max is, but I believe the iPhone 13 and the iPhone 13 Pro, I believe, are both 6.1 inches. Uh, the Samsung Galaxy S22 is 6.1 inches. Um, heck, even my freaking Sony Xperia 1 Mark or Sony Xperia 5 Mark 3 is 6.1. Like, I feel like that's the size that other manufacturers are going to conform to because the iPhone is 6.1 inches. So I'm excited. That fingerprint scanner in it, eh, we'll see how reliable it is. I know the, the, the regular Pixel 6 and the 6 Pro are having its issues with it, the, the in, in display fingerprint reader. So we'll see what it is here. But yeah, I must say, I, I am pretty excited uh, about this particular machine or this particular device. Plus, if Google has, has cited 24 hours of battery life, I mean, we know in order for them to even achieve that, whatever they did, they, you know, ran the brightness all the way down to almost nothing, uh, turned off all the radios and, you know, did whatever or you know whatever it is it, it's usually not real world usage to obtain whatever 
uh, things that, that, that whatever feats that they're, they're, they're predicting or, 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 or stating. So, uh, we'll see if anybody's ever actually able to, to reproduce a 24 hour battery for that pixel six a. Let's talk about Motorola as well. I mean, they're still working on their upcoming razor and the difference is that this time I'm actually excited. And here's why. I mean, according to a new report, this third generation razor will be a high end phone with flagship specifications and all while offering a lower price tag than the previous generation. Sounds like a Z Flip 3, but then we can expect it to start at 1149 in euros. And that means a 250 euro cheaper price tag than the Razer 5G. And it's safe to assume that it'll be that same amount in US dollars. I know it's still not Z Flip territory, but with the leak specifications for this year, I mean, I'm not necessarily mad. I mean, Motorola's new clamshell will reportedly bring the Qualcomm Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1 with up to 12 gigs of RAM paired with up to 512 gigs of storage options. Uh, previous rumors also showed that it could have a 6.7 inch full hd plus amoled display with 120 hertz refresh rate sadly we'll only get one color option with the black quartz but hopefully that expands if it finds success and just to wrap it up we can expect the new razor to go global with releases in china europe and north america with this new price tag though i mean would you prefer this over the flip 4 because i Maybe yeah, the answer is maybe. Maybe I don't. I mean, I'm not going to buy that, and, and I haven't, and don't plan on buying the uh, the the Z Flip Four. But I'm flagship level specs don't really matter. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't want to say they don't matter because that's that's not necessarily true. But like, for instance, I, I just mentioned that that the Pixel Four that I had, like, it was designed to be an affordable device. It, it was announced and released at $350, uh, gave you an overall solid Android experience. And, and that was fine. I, I am not a, a power phone user and there are plenty of people out there who are not, who just need something that works, works well, is supported for a while and we're good to go. So if putting a, a flagship level processor drives the price up, for you to get performance that you might not ever realize, is it worth it? I mean, yeah, it's up to the individual consumer. But when you have cheaper devices that have foregone on some of those more expensive features, it makes it nice. Like the Pixel 6a, if it's, I mean, at this point, it's only a $150 difference, uh, which for some people is a decent amount. But I mean, if we could go back when that Pixel 4a was released, it was 350 uh, I forget the timeline, but I think it came out after the five, which was confusing, I, I believe. But the five, I think, retailed for six ninety nine, so it's like almost half the price, and you're you know you're able to still get a phone. So so that right there is is a, a huge savings, and and for what you're foregoing is a different chip, uh, I think an a, additional one or two camera lenses. Um, uh, yeah, the the SOC. The, I mean, even in the Pixel Five, it still wasn't a flagship level level ship uh, chip. It was a mid ranger, but um, oh no, uh, no five G because they had the Pixel Four Five G, uh, Pixel Four A Five G. So yeah, there, there are things like that that help keep the price down that more consumers probably would enjoy. And of everything that I just mentioned right there, in terms of the, the flagship level chip, um, or the or five G. 5G, in my opinion, sometimes like it, it, it can just go. I mean, of course, that's going to be the natural progression. But when it's affordable enough to not impact the cost of the phone, then that's when I'm, I'd be like, hey, I'm all on board for it. But I mean, it's abundantly clear that when you put 5G radios in these phones, prices go up. And are consumers really benefiting from these 5G radios in the United States? I would say no. <laughs> And it's like, well, why did I pay a hundred dollars, hundred additional dollars for this phone? Well, because that's how they make it now, and and that really sucks. So remove the five G, put a mid range processor in it, um, and I don't know what other other cost corners. I mean, metal or plastic or carbon fiber. I don't know something that isn't necessarily metal or glass to to you know change the build quality a little bit. But you know, with these folding displays, I guess you got to really really want that in order for you to to go make that purchase at one point i probably will just to, to to see i mean i've said it before i have my microsoft surface duo so that's a folding phone but it has two separate displays 
So it's not concerned about the technology of a, a, a true folding display. So, and I also bought it used. I forget the brand, I think the brand new retail price of that thing was like 13 or 1400 bucks. And I think I paid 350 for it used. So, so yeah, it, it's buying used. I'm just rambling now, but uh, mainly because this wasn't a video that I had too much to say, but I figured, hey, practice, practice helps. But anyway, finding ways to make phones more affordable as a, and, and not saying it's affordable because it's cheaper than last year's phone. That's not necessarily making it affordable. They'll feel the flip four is a more mature phone, but we'll see. Now, moving on, uh, let's talk about Apple for the next couple of segments. It's been a pretty busy week when it comes to rumors for MacBooks and iPads, but hey, information continues to come in. Ross Young mentions that Apple will launch a new 13-inch MacBook along with two new 11 and 12.9-inch iPad Pro models, all with OLED displays. And yes, I know, if we're talking OLED, you're going to ask me now what the catch is. Well, apparently these will launch until 2024. He also said that the laptop is expected to be a new MacBook Air, but also stated that it possibly will have a different branding. Maybe the base MacBook is finally making a comeback and that's- And I'll say, you know, my opinion, that these leaks just kind of get out of hand. It's like, oh, there's gonna be a new MacBook. When's it coming out? In two years. All right, thanks, I guess. I mean. You know, and, and Apple products are definitely the ones I feel like get the most leaks or not even, not even leaks because we don't know we don't know if they're true, but the most mostly predicted products. But, yeah, you're telling me a MacBook is going to come out in two years. I, I don't think I could care less. I mean, I'm watching this video, so I care some. Uh, shoot, I'm even commenting on the video, so I care some. But, yeah, thanks for letting me know that an OLED Mac is coming out in, in two years. And I think that was the catch that it was not coming out later this year in 2022. But yeah, I feel like these leaks definitely just have gotten out of hand where somebody will say something and people will run with it. And there are some rep reputable leakers. Uh, but even then it, is it really doing us any favors? I don't know. I mean, if you're anxious about new products, cool. Um, but then I will say it definitely does take away from some of the reveal when it act when the products actually do get announced. So, you know, Am I going to stop watching? No, I'm not. But, you know, I will say, yeah, the number of leaks that, that, that have come about definitely have gone up substanti substantially, and some of them are accurate, some of them aren't. Um, and then, yeah, when the products are released or officially announced, it's more of a, hey, well, who got, who got the majority of the leaks right, you know? So it is what it is. Young also mentioned that the OLED displays in all three devices will adopt a two-stack tandem structure, allowing for more brightness and less power consumption. All of these devices will also adopt LTPO display technology for ProMotion capabilities, but these would be able to drop to one hertz instead of just 10. So for anyone waiting for an OLED Mac or iPad, it seems uh, there's still a bit of wait, but that also means you could probably buy the current ones safely and then just try to trade those in or resell them. And so I, I don't have access to, um, yeah, I, I don't have a, a 20 hertz display for my iPhone. I have an iPhone 12 mini. Uh, I think the 12 pros have the dynamic refresh rates, I think. Definitely the 13s, but I, th I think maybe the 12s. I don't know. But I, I do have a Samsung Galaxy S22 and an S22 Plus. And both of those have those variable refresh rates. And I'm sure Apple has implemented it however they do. And that's cool. And one day maybe I'll, you know, be able to, to, to experience whatever it is, but I will say it's good for battery life. If you're staring at static images a lot, which a lot of people do, you know, they'll, they'll scroll a little bit and stop and read and do whatever. But from my experience with these S 22s, the screens refresh rate, is dependent on what the user is doing with the phone, not what is happening on the phone screen. So case in point, when I am scrolling, yeah, I, and you can, with, with these Android devices, you can say, hey, just display the refresh rate on the screen. And for that S22, when you're moving and doing stuff with the screen, you're interacting with the screen, it ramps up to says 120. And then when you're not doing anything, it ramps all the way down to 24. 
And sometimes 60 will pop up. I, I think like sometimes when I pull down the notification shade, sometimes 60 would, would, would pop up. Um, but yeah, if I'm, if I'm looking just at text, I was okay with the 24 Hertz. Uh, but I, I was watching some movies on my, my phone on, on the Samsung galaxies and, and they were, they were Blu-ray rips. So there, there might've been something different compared to if I were just watching something on Netflix. So I, I do not have that experience. I, I did not take the time, excuse me, to watch anything on Netflix, but I am watching this YouTube video right now and like it's paused right now. And of course, when it's playing, it's probably displaying at, uh, 24 Hertz. But it ramps down to that 24, and for those Blu-ray rips at least, the the the, the picture got real jittery. It, it wasn't a good experience. So my concern would be, well, if I have a, a MacBook, which at some point that same technology will find its way into the iPhone, but if I have a MacBook and I'm watching video and I'm not interacting with the screen, does that ramp down to whatever its lowest capabilities are, or does it know to maybe stay at 24 or maybe 60? But if you're just looking at text, does it go down to one? Because with the watch that has that technology, and yeah, if you're just you know looking at the time, uh, most most of the clock on your wrist is going to be static. You have you know maybe a second hand or maybe the seconds you know numerically going up, um, but for the most part, that's a static image, so that's fine. I'm curious to see how the display on a MacBook will handle static images and how it will handle dynamic or moving images without you interacting with it. Because one hurt for any, it, it, it's not going to be a good experience. So I'll be curious to see how, how that un unfolds. And I guess whatever's happening on the latest iPhones probably is it, but I don't know if it ramps down to one hurt. So, um, so yeah, and of course Apple does things, you know, how, how are they going to do it? But yeah, I, I'm just curious to see if it truly does ramp down to one hurt or one hertz, maybe is it, it still hurts, even if it's just a singular one. Um, what's that going to look like while you're trying to watch video? Finally, for the hottest news today, let's stick to Apple and some interesting information about the new 13-inch M2 MacBook Pro that was just revealed and launched pretty much right now. Yes, I am not telling you to buy one because that design is about as ancient as it gets, but it does help us understand just how far ahead the M2 chip is. Just as a word of warning, if you ever bought a 2019 Mac Pro, this segment is going to upset you. I mean, Geekbench shows that the new 13-inch MacBook Pro, you know, that $1,300 laptop, achieved multi-core scores of 8,928, while the base Mac Pro configuration with the 8-core Intel Xeon processor has an average multi-score of 8,027. That's right. The $1,300 13-inch MacBook Pro is 11% faster in multi-core performance than the $6,000 base Mac Pro. The only way to get more power out of an Intel Mac is if you go for the configuration that cost $7,000. And here's the thing, we've seen what the M1 is capable of with the Pro, the Max, the Ultra variants, heck, even the base model. But if the base model of the M2 is already beating a device that's nearly four times more expensive and still on sale, I cannot wait for the M2 Pro variants and what those will do. But in today's question, let us know. I mean, have you already gotten an M1 MacBook or? Is yeah, so honestly, I I'm surprised that that is the news <laughs> for for today. I mean, that's not a, it's not, a, not a shocker. I mean, did I know that the base model M2 MacBook Pro outperforms the base uh, Mac Pro that came out, what, almost three years ago? No, I, I didn't know that, but it's not surprising. I mean, for everything we're dealing with the M1, whether it was the regular M1 or the, the Pros, the Maxes, the Ultras, whatever the naming structures are for those things, like, yeah, it's it's not a shock. So, I mean, great for letting us know. Um, but then <laughs> I, I, I can imagine, though, that if somebody did purchase this Mac Pro, and they're now looking to upgrade. They're probably not just going to buy a MacBook Pro to, to, to say, well, I'm just going to, no, they're going to wait for their, yeah, the, the equivalent Apple Silicon Mac Pro to come out, or maybe they, they went ahead and purchased a Mac studio or even one of the 13 or 14 or 16 inch MacBook Pros 
that, you know, have the M1 Ultra or Max or whatever they're called, uh, M1 Pros. So yeah, I, I, yeah. Is it surprising? No. Is it nice to hear? I guess. Like, hey, you know, you're, you're getting a, a far better machine and a more compact design that is now also portable that is outperforming something that you might have spent however many thousands of dollars on. So so that's nice. Uh, but yeah, they're, they're, their target demographics are just different, separate people. So yeah, the people might be pissed, but they're like, well, this happens. <laughs> uh, or maybe they're still just like, yeah, well, I need an Intel machine to do something. So I don't know. But yeah, for that to be the the the, the hypest thing of, of, of the day, I feel like was a, a pretty big miss. But I'm going to let him go ahead and finish. And I think he's just asking some questions and then talking about subscribing and stuff. So uh, yeah, sub subscribe to his channel if you haven't already done so. Is this making you consider one? Because, listen, I was one of the naysayers. If you go watch my videos on the M1s, I was like, yeah, I thought that these things, I, I had to review them. I didn't really care. But then I did an export against my $5,000 16-inch MacBook Pro at the time, and I stopped using that computer for that 13-inch MacBook Pro in the M1 variation that is now an M2 for the same money. Again, I'm not recommending you buy it, but oh my. Yeah, but see, even then, that's kind of a, 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 an equal comparison. I had two different laptops, an older one and a new one, and I stopped using my older laptop to start using this newer laptop versus, hey, I have this workhorse desktop. Yeah, the new laptops outperform it. But yeah, I, I don't know if somebody's going to say, well, I'm going to go buy this 13 inch MacBook Air or sorry, 13 inch MacBook Pro to replace my Mac Pro. I'm not saying it's not going to happen. And I am with him 100 percent. I wouldn't recommend buying this M2 MacBook 13 inch MacBook Pro either. Uh, but it's available, and if you need it, cool. And as of last week, I think um, they were sold out. Like, like pre-order started, and you know they definitely sold out pretty quick. If you needed anything more than just the the, the base configuration, um, and even that, I think there's probably a, a pretty substantial wait time. But a lot of that has to do with supply chain issues right now. So not necessarily that the not necessarily reflecting the popularity of the machine. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a performant thing. But the physical design of the machine is dated. And if you have the option of getting just the M2 MacBook Air, which is only $100 cheaper now, it used to be the, the price difference used to be greater. Or if you want to spend a little more money and get a 14 or 16 inch MacBook Pro, you're getting, you know, the updated design, a better screen. Um, of course, the base models of those come with uh, higher, higher amounts of RAM and storage. Um, but it's the M1 Pro or Ultra or whatever, or, or Max and not the M2. So you, you definitely have some, some decisions to make, but yeah, I think everybody's in agreement that buying a 13 inch MacBook Pro is a decision that you should not be making. God, just wait for the MacBook Air, you get the new design or wait for the new M Pros, which I'm not exactly sure they'll come out this year, but it's just, wow, it is so crazy that all I need now is for Apple to take gaming seriously. But that's just me. Leave us a comment down below. We'd love to know your opinion. Friends, again, if you want to get the news earlier, follow us on pocketnow.com and subscribe to our channel for more videos like this one. You can also follow us on social medias. Our extended coverage happens on Instagram and follow me on my personal handles to see me. Uh, I really don't even want to read the news lately. <laughs> and... Uh, the last thing he mentioned, which I am not a gamer at all, so I don't know, but I, I mean, I kind of thought that, you know, the whole gaming thing, part of it used to be like, Hey, Apple doesn't really care about gaming, but I've thought more recently based off of GPU scores that it looks like they're taking more powerful GPUs seriously. And then I thought that at that point now the game developers had some more work to do to make it so that they run better on Apple Silicon. I don't know. Again, I'm not a gamer and I'm still not completely sure how all that works uh, because we are, we're always benchmarking stuff and, and looking at CPU performance. But I thought, hey, if these GPUs are pretty good, then isn't it up for the software vendors to, to figure out how to make their stuff most efficient when it comes to what metal or whatever it is that that Apple is doing when it comes to, 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 to graphics and stuff like that. So anyway, uh, he's pretty much finished. Uh, you know, if, if you need to, if you feel obligated or inclined, I'll say to, sus to subscribe to his stuff, please do so. Uh, but that's all for this particular video. Um, yeah, not too much news, but you know, six a, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to that one. Um, M two MacBook pros, uh, and everything in between. Yeah, I really don't remember, but you know, if you watched it, great. <laughs>